Good morning, Walden Church. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about prayer, I had confessed to you that I talk to myself. I said that I say my prayers out loud, but I, I do. I talk to myself. And uh, yes, that's how I like to pray, but it's also one of my coping mechanisms. I talk to myself repeatedly, especially when I'm worried, especially when I'm stressed. And if there's some sort of a conversation that I'm going to have in the future, right? I'm gonna have some discussion with someone. Maybe I know that I need to confront somebody or maybe I have to apologize to somebody. What I end up doing is I'll rehearse what I'm going to say out loud. If I think I'm gonna have some upsetting conversation with you later, I go over it in my head. I talk the whole thing out, everything I'm gonna say. I also have restless leg syndrome. I've had it all my life. My mom uh, used to say that I had too much energy growing up, but uh, it's, it's, it's been with me my whole life. You know, it's never gone away, especially when I'm in bed and trying to go to sleep. I'll rock my foot back and forth. Um, another thing I do is I make lists. I make lists all the time, usually of things that I need to get done. I make to-do lists because one of my greatest fears is um, I'm going to have too much to do and I'm going to drop the ball on something that someone is counting on me to do. And if I have a long to-do list, then what happens is I have a sleepless night because I'm thinking about tomorrow in my head. So I'm going over those conversations I'm going to have and I'm going over the to-do list in my head and then I look over and it's three o'clock in the morning. My mind races back and forth. Call it stress, call it anxiety, but I'm a person who needs a little more peace in their life. I was especially aware of this about two years ago when I thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, I started taking really deep breaths, walked around the room, my fingertips were buzzing and my head was dizzy and it happened again a couple days later after that. And I talked with some other people about my symptoms and what had happened and I later found out that I was having a panic attack. I had never had one before. And oddly enough, we were talking about eating right and managing our weight last week. Um, after my panic attack, I visited my doctor and I said that uh, I was experiencing these symptoms. And my doctor said, number one, you're carrying too much weight. I was carrying too much weight, extra weight, and it was uh, putting a strain on my heart. And second, she told me that I needed to find ways to relax. So my orders from my doctor were lose weight, relax. That's just me, that's just me. Here's how the rest of the world is doing. 77% of Americans experienced physical symptoms during this last month as a result of stress. This includes fatigue, headache, upset stomach, muscle tension, uh, change in appetite, teeth grinding at night, feeling dizzy, uh, also irritability or anger, feeling nervous, having a lack of energy, or having a sensation that you could burst into tears. Half of adults lay awake at night uh, during the month because of stress. And on average, the average American loses 21 hours of sleep because of stress. A month. 21 hours of sleep a month. Last week we talked about eating better. Well, 43% overeat or eat unhealthy food and more than one third of us have skipped a meal because of stress in the past month. The over-the-counter drug industry is making a killing off of us. I mean, watch TV sometimes and just be conscious of all the drug commercials that you watch within one hour. And sadly, stress is no longer something just reserved for adults. One third of teenagers in the US say they feel stressed on a daily basis. Researchers suspect teenagers of feeling this stress, these overwhelming expectations placed onto them by both parents and society. And now in a high-tech world where people begin to expect more and more from children are little ones are experiencing levels of stress 
that their counterparts never saw in the past. No longer are children's lives stress-free, but they now become these little adults who are overtaxed in school, living with high expectations at home, and bogged down with all kinds of weekly extracurricular activities. Which brings us to our next topic for living our best life. Can we make a little change or some small change that's gonna help us live with less anxiety? Something that's gonna help us uh, get a little closer to finding some peace in our life. Last week we talked about you know, our, our bodies being the temple of God and we said we should be mindful of our bodies. We should be mindful of our health. We should be conscious of what we eat. But worry and stress and anxiety, this affects our hearts and our minds, doesn't it? And sure, there's all kinds of natural times that you would worry, of course. I mean, if your loved one is ill, uh, when your children haven't come home yet and it's two o'clock in the morning, or maybe when you're in peril, right? When you're in mortal danger. But what we're talking about today is anxiety. And I don't know your personal belief. I don't know, uh, you know where you stand on this, but the Bible says that worry is a sin. Proverbs 12 says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5 says, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. You know, in my own life, I have come to the understanding that any sin, okay, any sin at all, can be boiled down to one word, selfishness. Because sin is where we put ourselves in the place that God should be. If you're wondering if your actions are sinful, just ask yourself, who is sitting on the throne in that situation? Is it me? Am I number one? Then maybe I should re-examine the situation. And anxiety is no exception. Anxiety is when we rely on our own power and our own provision rather than God's we fail to live in these promises that I just read and we refuse to cast all our care on him. Anxiety also anticipates the very worst and it turns into apprehension or anticipation of danger or misfortune or trouble. Anxiety is restlessness and agitation. It produces a mental disturbance, it's uneasiness, it's foreboding, it's a painful uncertainty. In other words, anxiety destroys the soul. But don't take my word for it. In Romans chapter 14, Paul is writing to a group of Christians who are struggling with, ironically enough, what they eat. And some Christians felt that their faith was weak if they couldn't free themselves from the old Hebrew dietary restrictions. And Paul is kind of stepping in between these two camps and he's hoping to reassure them both. Paul says, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. For whoever does not proceed from faith is sin. Bible translator Eugene Peterson translates this last part like this. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Let me repeat that. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Anxiety all comes down to what do you believe? The prophet Hosea says, my people, Israel, are destroyed from lack of knowledge. What do you believe? Do you believe that God's power gives us everything we need. Do you believe that? Second Peter says his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So why am I stressing out? Do you believe that God is stronger than your weakness? First Corinthians says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear 
but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So why am I worried? Do you believe our strength comes from the Lord? 1 Corinthians says he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Do you believe that God is in control of all of creation? Psalm 95 says, For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. You know, two weeks ago, we talked about listening to God. And our verse was that the sheep know his voice. Jesus compares you and I to sheep very often. Do you think sheep have anxiety? You know, if they trust their shepherd to protect them from wolves, if they trust their shepherd to lead them beside still waters, the author of Psalm says, hey, there's no other gods beside God. He holds all of the world in his hand because he made it. He even made you. Our God cares for us just like a shepherd cares for sheep. So we can live and we can rest assured. So is that what you believe this morning? Because if it is, then we need to make that how we live. There's a great example in the book of Mark, and it's the widow's offering. And you probably know the story. It says that Jesus sat down opposite the treasury, and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. This poor woman gave to the church 100% of her money. Not a tithe, not a love offering, not 10%. A woman with nothing put everything in the collection plate. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't make any assurances here for her. He doesn't make any promises here. He merely points it out to people who are watching. So tell me, what what do you believe? What do you believe? Do you believe that woman went home that day and starved? Do you believe that she was evicted from her home? Do you believe that that woman was still able to pay her debts and to sleep in a warm bed? You know, there's a very old church hymn that reads, Give what you have and the Lord will give you more. Give what you have, there's plenty more in store. If you give what you have, it will open heaven's door. If you give what you have to the Lord. Do you honestly believe that? Do we believe that God turns our tithe into blessing. If we do, then we need to live our lives like that. Not tomorrow, today. Because if the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Jesus' last week is recorded for us in the book of Mark. It's in chapters 11 through 14. And first, we see Jesus tells his disciples, go find a cult, right? And And they find it, and they untie it, and they bring it back. They do it. But can you imagine what that would look like? It'd be like if I told you to go to a certain location at the Walmart parking lot and find the Lincoln Navigator with the keys in the ignition and I want you to drive it back to me. How brave would you have to be to do that? Oh, and if somebody tries to stop you while you're doing it, you simply tell them, my pastor needs this. Why in the world would a colt that nobody has ridden be tied up in the middle of town because it was God's special provision and it was just waiting. And then Jesus' disciples are asking about the preparations for the Passover meal and they ask Jesus, hey, what do you want us to do? Do we need to go shopping? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's all been taken care of. Does that make any sense to you? Taken care of by whom? When? When did this happen? Can you imagine a large upper room 
was prepared, furnished, and unused in Jerusalem for Passover. I mean, it's like the Super Bowl is completely sold out. And the disciples say, whose house are we going to go to to watch it on TV? And Jesus says, oh, don't worry. Uh, we have Skybox tickets. Remember when Jesus taught his disciples to pray? What, what did he say? In Matthew 6, he teaches, and give us this day our daily bread. Right? Which comes from the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 10, or Proverbs 30, sorry. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Both of those illustrate the assurances that our Heavenly Father provides for our daily needs. So we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry. What do you believe this morning? Do you believe that God will meet or exceed your daily needs? If so, then we need to live our lives like that. Not tomorrow, today. Because if the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. The good news is, God is the God of all peace. You know, you're looking for peace. You're looking to get rid of stress, get rid of anxiety. God is the God of all peace. That's the good news. As much as you want to experience peace in your life, God desires it for you even more. Jesus says in his most famous sermon, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? You know, when I was dating Joanna, uh, Peggy, my mother-in-law, had a magnet on her refrigerator that was a quote from Scottish Baptist minister Alexander McLaren. And it said, what good can worry do? Worry cannot empty tomorrow of sorrow. It merely empties today of strength. Church, anxiety wants to steal your life. Anxiety wants to rob you of time away from your family. Anxiety wants to destroy God's joy that takes place in your ministry, and, and, if, and it will. It will if you let it. So what can we do? We need some anxiety busters, right? Of course, like we've been saying, God is the great anxiety buster. He doesn't want you to live in a prison of worry, and only he holds the key to give us the peace that we need. So I want to move you through three different anxiety busters that will shift us all from anxiety to peace so that we can live our best life. And the first one is we need to move from worry to prayer. Move from worry to prayer. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked, and besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all churches. Who here, who watching right now, you're watching at home, raise your hand if you've experienced a life like that. None of us, right? None of us. Paul says, on top of the stress that I daily face in my own life, I also feel the weight for all, for all of you. I feel the weight of all the churches. But he says over in Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The answer to the stress and the worry and the anxiety of Paul's world was not to run away, right? That wasn't Paul's option. He said, I'm not going to run away, or I'm not just going to curl up in a ball and hide on the floor. 
But instead, he says, we lay it all down at the feet of the king through prayer. We are not called to run away or to avoid tension or to avoid challenges. We are called to answer life's stresses with prayer. Paul says, send all of that worry and all of that doubt and all of that anxiety, send it all up. What I would do is I would identify one area of your life where worry is probably the most common. And then just to commit to praying every single time it rears its ugly head. Second, let's move from my plan to God's will. I've always found the story of calling the disciples a very interesting one. In Matthew 4, Jesus says, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Peter and John. Okay, Jesus, but what about our plans? We want to become the best fishermen. How are we going to provide for our families? What about our jobs? What does Jesus say? Quit your jobs. Right? Matthew says, what about me, Jesus? I work for the government. I have a great job. What does Jesus say? Quit. Quit your job. In his book, Irresistible Revolution, author Shane Claiborne, he called Mother Teresa on the phone and asked if he could come to Calcutta and help her with the poor. And her response was, sure, come. He quickly got worried and he said, well, what am I going to eat? Where am I going to live? And she said, just come. Jesus says to you and me, follow me. And my plans have to go bye-bye. And my anxiety about my plans have to go bye-bye as well. Jesus even models this for us in his own life. In talking, about, uh, the, to, in talking to the crowds in John 5, Jesus gives them this answer. He says, very truly I tell you, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And then, even on the last night of his life before the cross, Jesus fights his own worry with prayer. In Luke 22, he prays, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Okay, but how do I know what God's will is for my life? I should know what that is. Well, that's easy. God's will for your life is that you follow him and obey him. If you need more detail than that, I suggest you pray. Third, we need to move from alone to hand in hand with God. When Joshua succeeds Moses, the Bible records God saying, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God wants you to know that you will never be alone. Part of how anxiety attacks us is by making us think that we're going through this alone, that nobody understands us, that everybody else has a great life, and it's only us that's going through trial. Anxiety hurts us when it feels like that it's us against the world and that none of us can handle it on our own. And I can see why that would be a legitimate thing to stress about, because we can't. We can't change the world on our own. We can't succeed at our jobs alone. We can't succeed in school alone. We can't raise our kids alone. We can't do ministry alone. So God wants us to know that we are never alone. Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. If you are feeling the pressures and the anxiety of life right now, Maybe it's because you are trying to do it all by yourself. We need more times of stillness and silence in our life, more times of quietness, more times of peace. When anxiety and stress wants to steal my life, I have to remember to release it, to let it go. And I, it's hard, I know. But don't you really believe that Jesus can take away your fear? Don't you really believe that he can handle 
the to-do list in your life? Don't you really believe that he is in control? That I need more of that in my life? Not tomorrow, I need it today. Because if the way that I live isn't consistent with what I believe, then it's wrong and I need to repent of it. If you are confident in God, if you are confident in the ground on which you stand, you shouldn't be worrying. If you are secure that the bridge that's holding you is strong, then you don't need to reach out to steady yourself. Of course we all fear the unknown. Absolutely, I know. The path up ahead is unsure, it's cloudy, but we have to remain confident that the light ahead is not going to be found in more money or a new job or a better church or more obedient children or higher grades or even a different spouse. Uncertainty will not go away when you're healthy or when you're in a new home or when your bills are paid or when you get married. The light up ahead is Christ and your doubts about living and your anxiety will go away when you take it off of your shoulders and place it onto his. I know you are experiencing a lot of anxiety right now. These past two years have been very rocky. We have been living with anxiety and we are taxed more so than ever. We are stressed financially. We are stretched physically. Wouldn't you like to drop all of this worry down at God's feet? Practice that. Think about the worry and the stress that you have and boil it all down to just some imaginary object in your hand. And as you hold on to it, ask yourself, is this something that I really want to keep? Do I want to continue to carry this? Do I want this to follow me? Or do I want to release it and let it go? Do I want to leave it with Jesus? Do I want to leave this in his hands, not mine? This should be our closing prayer. This should be our doxology. We should leave with the understanding that he has it. He has whatever this is. He has it. And he will accomplish for his good. We don't have to worry. We can release it and give it to Jesus. You know, when you're here and you're at church, one of the postures that we can take when we worship is to open our hands like this when we sing. And it can either be seen as a way to receive all of God's blessing because he does bless us and we don't have to worry that blessing is coming. Or this posture is a way of saying, I release it. I release it all to you. I give it all to you. Whatever was in me, whatever I'm holding on to, whatever weight is on my shoulders, I release it. Practice that posture this week. Practice that posture in worship with the songs that you know. Practice this posture in prayer. Receive God's blessing and release your stress. Release your anxiety. Give it to Jesus. Bring it to the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that your shoulders are wider than ours and stronger. And it's silly for us to shoulder the weight of the world when we were never meant to. You bore all of the world's sin on the cross and you took it on because only you could. So we ask that any stresses or anxieties that I feel right now, whether they are my own or they are the stresses that I carry for others, I worry about my neighbors, I worry about my family, I worry about my friends, but I realize that I cannot change the world. Lord, I know you have a plan and I trust you. I need more faith. Strengthen my faith so that I can release it all. 
so that I can give it all to you, lay it all down at the foot of the cross and walk away to lay my burden down. Lord, I thank you for love, for grace, for forgiveness, for blessing. Help me to be the child of God that you need me to be in every day of my life. Give me this day my daily bread. And may your kingdom come and may your will be done. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Of course, I would like to remind you that we are always open, right? The church is open, uh, not just on Sundays. You know, we're open during the week too. Uh, our office is open till 3 p.m. every single day. And of course, we would love to see you. If you haven't been by in a while, please stop by, please visit, even if it's just to say hi. If you're going to Walmart or coming back from Walmart, uh, stop by the church and just say howdy to us. Uh, I'd remind you that we are preparing for Trunk or Treat. And so that means that we're collecting candy. So if you're able to purchase bags of candy for us, you can drop it by the church office. And of course, that'd be a great way to visit. On Sundays, we're here with two services, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service. We sing hymns with our choir. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service with a worship band. And we also have a children's program and youth group. Our youth group also meets during the week on Wednesdays. Uh, they're here starting at 6 p.m. So you can send your child over on their skateboard or their bike. We'll even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. Uh, we also have a grieving support group right now. So if you've experienced loss in your own life or you know someone who is struggling with loss, uh, Wednesdays at noon is a completely drop-in uh, support group. It's a group of people that are just walking through the same things and they would love to be with you and give you support and pray with you in any way. Walden Community Church wants to be the church where you live. We're here for you. Please come by, call, email us, and let us know how we can help you. I love you. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.